Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth annual Getzen Lecture in Government Accountability. Let me ask you if you'll do as I have just done and turn off your cell phone. The Getzen Lecture is made possible by a very generous gift from two University of Georgia alumni. Catherine Getson Willoughby, who holds the PhD in Public Administration, and Dan Hall Willoughby, who holds the Juris Doctorate degree from the university. Dan is unable to be with us today, but Catherine is uh, seated here in the front, and I'm going to embarrass you again and ask you if you'll please stand and let us recognize you. <laughs> I'd also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to recognize uh, my boss, uh, President of the University of Georgia, Michael Adams, is seated over here, uh, President Adams. <laughs> Newt Gingrich is chairman of the Gingrich Group, a communication and consulting firm that specializes in transformational change. Early in his career, he was professor of history and environmental studies at West Georgia College for eight years. He was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1978 and represented the 6th District of Georgia for 20 years. He was the co-author of Contract with America in 1994, but perhaps more importantly was the architect of the movement that led to the Republican Party victory in 1994 gaining a Republican majority in the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. In 1995, he was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives and served until 1999. He was Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1995. He's the author of 18 fiction and nonfiction books, 10 of which have been included on the bestseller list of the New York Times. Most of his novels are fictional accounts of historical wartime bat battles. Many of his nonfiction books are about the concept of change, especially environmental change and healthcare change. He's a distinguished visiting scholar and professor at the National Defense University, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and a political analyst for Fox News. He and his wife host and produce documentaries, including one about President Ronald Reagan. And the fourth documentary is currently in production. Speaker Gingrich earned the bachelor's degree from Emory University and master's and PhD degrees from Tulane University in history. As you might imagine, he's a highly sought-after public speaker, speaking to large audiences and prestigious organizations throughout the world. And we're indeed fortunate and honored to have him at the University of Georgia uh, this afternoon. His topic is Effective American Policy in a Dangerous World. And please join me in welcoming Speaker Newt Gingrich. Thank you all very much, and Dean, thank you for the opportunity to come here. I uh, am really honored to have a chance to share ideas with the members of your school, and I congratulate you on uh, once again achieving a national ranking uh, in the U.S. News uh, estimate that you're among the top five schools in the country uh, in public administration. And so I feel like I have a chance to talk to people who really may well help shape the future. So I'm going to give you, for a few minutes, uh, a fairly fundamental overview of the scale of change we need and the principles that I think will drive that change. For those of you who are interested, I'm also going to cite several books 
uh, that I would commend you to look at in more detail, since you may well be practitioners. As background for this uh, report, and then I'm going to toss over the questions in a little while, but as background for this report, let me just say that, that um, my dad was a career soldier. I was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. When he came back from Korea, we uh, went to Fort Riley, Kansas for three years, and then ended up in Orléans, France. And uh, this was in 1957-58, when they were losing the war in Algeria, having lost the war in Southeast Asia, having earlier lost to the Germans in World War II. There was World War II bomb damage on the way to our school that we passed every day. Um, we went to school in an armored bus, uh, which was designed to be used for troop transport and combat. We uh, were in an economy which had 100% inflation. So we were paid with script. They didn't give us American dollars uh, because it would have destroyed the French currency. So here I am, you know, a kid from the US for the first time overseas, and we're getting this kind of funny money. Uh, but it was an introduction to economics. Uh, and that summer, the French Fourth Republic was killed by the paratroopers who came back from Algeria and uh, brought de Gaulle back. And he created the French Fifth Republic, uh, which is now uh, still in existence. And Sarkozy is the president of the, of the Fifth Republic. Um, that spring of 1958, we went to the battlefield of Verdun, which was the largest battlefield in World War I. And about 600,000 people died there in a nine-month period. And we uh, stayed with a friend of my father's who had been drafted in 1941 and uh, sent to the Philippines and ended up serving on the Bataan Death March uh, and spent three and a half years in a Japanese prison camp. So here I was. I was a young kid. I, I was planning to either uh, become a vertebrate paleontologist or a zoo director. And I really liked the outdoors, and I liked Natural, I like the natural world. But I was really haunted by that weekend. And we were transferred that summer to Stuttgart, which was the headquarters of the US 7th Army at the time. And um, in August, having thought about it for months and prayed about it, I decided that civilizations can die and that um, you had to have some people who would spend their lifetime basically on three questions. What is it? that America has to do in order to survive. How do you communicate that to the American people so they decide it is worth doing? And if they give you permission to do it, how would you actually implement it? And I have now spent, uh, as of this coming August, uh, 51 years working on that. My dad was transferred in 1960 to Fort Benning, and I came to Georgia through uh, Columbus and went to Baker High School uh, and have been active in the Georgia GOP uh, ever since. So that's the background. I got to be Speaker of the House. I ran, for those of you interested in politics, uh, I was very active as a volunteer starting in 1960. Uh, I dropped out of college for a year to run a campaign in North Georgia. And given the pattern of my luck that would continue for a long time, I picked the only district in Georgia that Goldwater lost and Lyndon Johnson carried. Uh, I then went back to school, got my degree, uh, went off and got a PhD from Tulane, uh, came back and uh, ran for Congress. And the first time I ran was in 1974 in the middle of Watergate. And people suggested to me that it was unlikely I could win against the dean of the Georgia delegation and fourth ranking member of the Appropriations Committee in the middle of a huge Republican scandal. It turned out they were right. I got 48.5%, uh, <laughs> got which was good enough to run a second time. And, and I was teaching at West Georgia College at the time. And I would take leave of absence without pay run for Congress, get beat, go back and teach for a few years. Uh, the second time I decided to run was 1976. And I'll never forget uh, standing in front of the television uh, uh, early in the morning on Wednesday morning uh, in April, watching the Today Show as Jimmy Carter came from behind in Wisconsin to win the Democratic primary against Mo Udall. Mo Udall was the more liberal candidate and generally considered the favorite. Uh, but the dairy farmers of rural Wisconsin decided they identified with a peanut farmer from Georgia. And so Carter won. I realized standing there that if Carter could beat Udall in Wisconsin, he was going to be the Democratic nominee, and that I would be faced with running on the Republican ticket 
against a favorite son Georgia candidate and that I would have to run the best campaign of my life to survive in order to run for a third time. Uh, so I did, and I did run probably the best campaign I've ever run. And by election day, and this happens to you when you're a candidate, as Ralph can tell you, because we've been out campaigning together since 1988, you, you, you get all excited and all your volunteers are excited. And, uh, then you are faced with reality. So on election day, uh, I was really excited. It was a tremendous campaign. And I went down to vote at the Neva Lomason Library in Carrollton, Georgia. And I realized I was standing in line behind four people who had come from the nursing home to vote for a favorite son for president. And I thought to myself, as a Yankee-born army brat with a strange name and a strange accent, uh, college professor, what were the odds that they were going to split their ticket? <laughs> and I realized, listening to them talk as they stood in line, that they were there to get revenge for Sherman's march through Georgia. <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be a long, long evening. Uh, and it was. I, I went from 48.5% in 1974 to 48.3% in 1976. And then I, think I came back and won in 78. When I won, I went to the head of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee in December of 78. And I said, you know, We've been a minority for 24 years. We really need a plan to become a majority. And he said, that's a terrific idea. <laughs> Why don't you chair the planning committee? So I found myself as a freshman chairing a committee to plan a majority, which turned out to be one of the most creative periods I could have ever been in that role, because an old friend of mine, Bill Brock of Tennessee, had become Republican National Committee Chairman. And I now had the technical standing to go and work with him because I was chairing this planning committee. Well, Brock was clever enough that when Margaret Thatcher won uh, in Great Britain, he brought her campaign team over to learn what they had done as a, as, a, as a conservative to win in Great Britain. And so I spent a lot of time with the, the, the Thatcher team, learned an immense amount. And the first Capital Steps event was not the contract with America in 1995, I mean 1994. It was actually in September of 1980 uh, with Reagan and Bush. It was the first time we'd ever gotten all of the House and Senate candidates together. We won the Senate that year by six Senate races in which the combined margin was 75,000 votes. And I'm personally convinced that if they had not had the Capitol Steps event and been able to stand next to Reagan, and we actually gave them five things to stand for which allowed them to then talk on TV and radio back home, be validated. Uh, Mac Mattingly was running here against Senator Talmadge, uh, and I am certain that Mattingly would have lost without the additional boost and publicity of that event. I then lost, and we gained 33 seats. We gained control of the Senate, won the presidency, but did not quite win the House. <coughs> we then lost in 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, and 92. So when people talk about what a great year 94 was, I think they have no idea how much effort went behind it. When we won in 94, I became speaker. And in a four-year period, uh, we reformed welfare in the most decisive uh, conservative reform in modern times. 65% of the people in welfare either went to work or went to school. Their lives got better. Their families got better. Their incomes went up. Uh, we uh, cut taxes for the first time in 16 years. And in a three-year negotiation with President Clinton, uh, we balanced the federal budget for four consecutive years, paid off $405 billion in debt uh, for the first time since the 1920s, and did so while strengthening defense and intelligence and doubling the size of the National Institute of Health budget to help biomedical research. I give you that as background because I, I, I then had the fortunate experience when I stepped down as speaker and uh, the Bush administration came in. Uh, President Clinton had already been, done, done me a great favor and asked me to serve on the Hart-Rudman Commission, which I had helped create. Uh, and that was a commission to look out at national security through 2025, <coughs> the most comprehensive three-year review of national security since 1948. And then when the Bush team came in, uh, I had Tommy Thompson, who's an old friend of mine, become chairman of Health and Human Services. Uh, Don Rumsfeld became secretary of defense. Uh, Dick Cheney was vice president. <coughs> and the result was I had basically open access to the whole system. What that did is it gave me an ability as somebody whose background had been in the legislative branch 
to spend years inside the executive branch trying to solve problems and trying to learn. And it was enormously helpful. And I give you all this background because I'm going to tell you some judgments I've reached that are very tough. Uh, and I want you to understand the background of those judgments. I, I spent about 40% of my time on health and about 40% of my time on national security from 2001 through 2007. And the peak moment for me was in December of 2004 when uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and, and uh, National Security Advisor Rice and uh, Vice President Cheney sponsored me. And I, I spent, took 53 hours of briefings uh, in December on the global war on terror and the war in Iraq, trying to understand what was not working. And it was a revelation, just, just as advice, if you can compress your learning into a very intense period, you can remember the meetings. I mean, if you took the same 53 hours of briefings and you spread them over a year, it would be very hard in the December meetings to remember vividly what was in the January meetings. But if you take all of them inside three weeks, and remember we had Christmas in that month, so I literally took 53 hours of briefings in three weeks. You pretty well remember by the time you get to the last briefing what was the first briefing was about. What struck me was that the problems in national security were remarkably similar to the problems in health, that the bureaucracy simply didn't work that they were very, very resistant to facing reality, and they were very resistant to change. And in trying to understand that and think it through in January and February of 2005, I spent some time talking with the former campaign manager uh, for uh, the Bush presidential campaign in 2004. And he, explained, he had explained to me during the campaign that he was using metrics in order to uh, manage how the campaign operated and to set the campaign up uh, in a way that would be effective. And I was fascinated by it, and so I called him and said, you know, tell me more about this use of metrics to keep you in touch with reality. And he said, well, the truth is, I got it from Giuliani, that Giuliani had used it in New York. So I called Rudy, and he said, well, this is how we did it. These are the people who did it. Here's who you ought to talk to. And I ultimately ended up uh, with Dennis Smith, who is the probably leading expert on metrics-based management at, NY, at New York University. But in the process, I also ended up with Chief Bratton, who had been the, the police chief who had instituted the program and went on to Los Angeles. I really recommend to all of you uh, Giuliani's book on leadership, uh, called Leadership, which is a terrific study of how you lead a large bureaucratic unionized city, uh, arguably the second most complex government in the United States, uh, and how you get real change because he did get real change. I mean, there's, there's no question New York City after eight years of Giuliani was dramatically different than it was at the end of the Dinkins era, uh, and different in almost every way that was positive. More jobs, cleaner, safer, more tourists, people felt better. Uh, it was a remarkable accomplishment of leadership. Uh, at the same time, you know it's a system because it's called CompStat for computer statistics. And the CompStat system, fundamentally changed how they measured data in New York. And you know it's a system because New York dropped, the crime rate in New York dropped 75% between 1993 and 2006. Now you could say that was an accident. Well, Bratton took the same system to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles today is the second safest city in the United States. New York is the safest. There's something here that works. The heart of it, is three steps. The first is for senior leadership to describe what matters. Historically, the police had measured two things. How many arrests were there, and uh, how fast could you answer a 911 call? Bratton came in and said, we don't care about that. I mean, would it really comfort you to be told we had more arrests in your precinct last night than anywhere else in the city? He said, what we care about is crime. He said, I want to report every night at 5 of every crime committed in your precinct in the last 24 hours. What time was it committed and where was it committed? Then they instituted a system of every Thursday. New York, New York has 76 precincts, and every Thursday, five or six of them would come in, 
And one by one, they would go through an analysis and planning session with the other five watching. And so it was a, it was a collective planning and, and studying program. And they would say, let's look at the last six weeks trend. I actually went out to Los Angeles and spent two days with Bratton in the system just looking at it. So they start with, what were your last six weeks like? OK? What is your strategy for coping with it? Because the goal was not to maximize arrests. The goal was to minimize crime. And I want to repeat this, because I want you to understand how important this is. The goal was not to maximize arrests. The goal was to minimize crime. Think about it. If I say to you, what if, there are no, what, what if I make no arrest in your neighborhood next year because there are no crimes? Would you feel better or worse? Would you say, that's a really stupid police department? They didn't make any arrests. Or would you say, that's a terrific police department? There was no crime. That's a fundamentally different way of thinking because it's an outcome-based measurement model, not a process-based measurement model. Well, there are a couple of things to know about this. And Bratton, by the way, wrote a book called Turnaround, which I recommend second. Read Giuliani first, then read Bratton, because Bratton tells you how they implemented it at a practical level. Giuliani tells you the political process by which they implemented it, which is a, they're both worth studying, because you have to have both of them. If you don't get the political process right, you won't have the authority to get the practical process right. So here's the number one thing to remember. The implementation of real change involves willpower. There were 76 precinct captains in a city which had 44,000 policemen. So those 76 precinct captains are a big deal. They hated the new process. And most of them said to Bratton and Giuliani, we're not doing it. We're not keeping track in every crime, and we're not going to assign some cop to sit down, and what, by the way, they didn't have any money in the budget for computers, so they went out to the business community and raised a million dollars to buy the computers so they could process the data. CompStat was actually an IBM program. And so now they're saying to these crusty, old, traditional police chief, you know, uh, precinct captains, you are going to collect this data every day, and at 5 o'clock every day, you're going to have a policeman input it into a computer, and it's going to come downtown. Well, they hated it. First of all, they didn't like telling downtown anything because it, it reduced their power. They were in charge of their precinct. Second, cops did real things. Cops didn't sit around typing on some stupid computer. Third, cops worried about arrests. Cops didn't worry about crime. Everybody in sociology knew that you couldn't affect crime. The only two people in America who had written that the police could affect crime were political scientists, of whom the most famous was James Q. Wilson. There was an article called Broken Windows, in which they described the idea that if you, could, if you could make a neighborhood look nice, you raise the threshold of crime. So when a neighborhood looks terrible and it has graffiti and the windows are broken, you actually lower the psychological barrier to crime. Well, Bratton had gone to, he was a street cop from Boston. He'd become the police chief in Boston. He'd gone to school at, at the Kennedy School in, at Harvard, and he actually believed that, let's try it out. So here are all these old time cops going, you can't make me do that. That's not what cops do. They said, fine, you don't have to do it. But by the way, the precinct captain is going to do it. Three out of every four precinct captains were replaced the first year. Important to remember, you want real change, it, calls, it takes real change. Real change means you look people in the eye and go, you know, we're going this way. We'd like to have you come with us. You don't want to come with us. IBM used to have a rule. Everybody has to have a job, but not here. And Giuliani is brilliant in explaining how you do that in a unionized bureaucracy that, that has lifetime employment. And he, they, had, they, they really thought through what they were doing, and they really manipulated the bureaucracy exactly according to the rules, but with enormous willpower. Um, the third book I want to recommend to you after Giuliani and Bratton is by Michael Lewis. It's called Moneyball, and it's about the application of metrics by the Oakland Athletics. And Billy Bean is the general manager is very funny and tells great stories. Um, I won't go into it in detail for time reasons, but it is absolutely worth your reading first to realize how few places take metrics. Baseball had many statistics and no metrics. The 
turns out, for example, if you evaluate the most effective offensive play in baseball, does anybody here know what it is? It's a walk. A walk is a no-risk event. A team which walks in every play will end, in, end the game in the, in, the, in the first inning because they'll never get out unless they're stupid and get off base. And so they fundamentally revolutionized what they were looking for. Now, the scouts hated it. Most of the scouts quit at the end of the first year because they hated a metrics-driven system of scouting. And it's worth your reading because it will teach you a lot about the human psychology of organization. So I took those three models, the whole way in which metrics occurred in New York, the way in which Bratton took it to Los Angeles, and the way in which uh, Billy Bean used it. And we actually brought Billy Bean in to talk to our Center for Health Transformation and describe to us what he'd done with metrics. And I applied it to rethinking the Defense Department and the health system. And not just the Defense Department, but the entire national security apparatus, which includes the State Department, foreign aid, the National Security Council, uh, and uh, the intelligence community. And we then got nowhere. Because you have these huge bureaucracies capable of resisting. Uh, if you want to understand the model we're building on, and I'm going to apply it in a second, but if you want to understand this model, uh, Nancy Desmond and I wrote a book two years ago called The Art of Transformation. It is a graduate level introduction to how you change large scale systems. I've been, I've been an advisor, for example, to the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command since 1979 on how you rethink the military. I'm the longest serving teacher in the student life. I've also been actively involved in health and how you rethink the health system. I helped create a majority. We then reformed welfare and balanced the budget. So I, over the years, I picked up a few ideas about how you do this. I'm just going to give you one of the key ideas out of what is literally a, a virtually a graduate textbook. And it's the following. If you want to understand how to get to effective anything, you have to start in a structured way, first of all, by defining your values. What, what Bratton and Giuliani did is they said what we value is safety, not crime fighting. So if we can get to safety, we've, we've succeeded. Therefore, we're going to have strategies that eliminate crime which is different than a strategy for suppressing crime. So, for example, what's our, what are our values for young people in terms of learning? And if you could write that down, then the next level is vision. Given the values you've defined, what would your vision of success be? The third level, after you've defined values and vision, is metrics. And the key to, the reason metrics matter is you have to have in the real world some measurement of whether or not you're making progress. <coughs> so what would you measure? The fourth level, which actually comes after you've thought through your values, your vision, and your metrics, is strategies. Now that we know what you want to measure, what are your strategies for measuring it? I'm not going to go through the rest of the, the rest of the model. It takes another 10 minutes. I'm not going to go through it. I just want to stop right here. So. Let's talk about the Detroit school system. The Detroit school system has 26% uh, of its entering freshmen graduate on time. 74% of the kids in Detroit are cheating. Now, I would start by saying let's have a conversation about why do we, you know, why did we have a school system in the first place? Does it, for example, relate to students' learning? And is that a significant value to us? So let's list our values for the children of Detroit. And for that matter, for the generation of illiterate, ignorant adults who are now trapped in poverty because they need to learn too. So I would design a learning value system. And then I'd create a vision. My personal vision for learning is that it ought to be 24-7. It ought to be pulled forward by the learner. It ought to have many, many different styles and systems because people learn in many different ways. And there ought to be ways to incentivize people to maximize their rate of learning fundamentally radically different than the mess you guys have spent most of your career in. Because look, because what have you been in? You've been in bureaucratic structures built around the interests of the teacher. And that's the essence of what you've been through. And you know that at the K through 12 level, it's all baloney. And I'll give you a simple example, since we have a lot of students here. 
for the students who are here who, who have been in high school in the last 10 years, because I'm going to eliminate a few of them. Um, I, I have a simple proposition for how you dramatically start changing education at no cost. Create a system where if you can graduate from high school in three years, you get the fourth year cost of high school as an automatic scholarship. Now, <laughs> simple test question. How many of you think you could have gotten through high school in three years? Raise your hand. No, raise your hand. Raise your hand and look around the room. Okay. Now, let me just tell you, as, as a historian and commentator, and this happens in every room I go in, you all just agreed that at a minimum, we are wasting one third of your time in high school. That's stupid. I mean, this is a, and if you want to see a test of this, uh, get a movie called Two Million Minutes. Uh, you can find it at 2mminutes.com. It's a movie created by Bob Compton, who is a uh, health entrepreneur who sold a medical device for $400 million and took part of the money and went to and did a movie about two Indian high school students, two Chinese high school students, and two American high school students. When you see the movie, Two million minutes is four years of high school. You will realize that we are a nation aggressively preparing for the 1956 Olympics. <laughs> we are so out of sequence with our competitors that it is terrifying. Uh, when we did the Hart Rudman Commission, I, I'd been active in 1983 as a congressman. I hosted meetings on a nation at risk, which was the 1983 report which said that we are now uh, our schools are so bad that if an enemy did to our children, we're doing to them, we'd consider it an act of war. And the schools are so bad that the nation is at risk. This is 1983. We came back in 2001, and we said in the Hart Rudman Commission in March of 2001, the greatest threat to the United States is a weapon of mass destruction going off in a city, probably from a terrorist group. The second greatest threat to the United States is the failure of math and science education, and it is a larger threat than any conceivable conventional war. Now, you would have thought that would be fairly stunning in a defense production. It just bounced off the system totally. So if you want to test this out, go to 2mminutes.com, and you can take the Indian 10th grade exit exam, which is a prerequisite to going to the 11th grade on the academic track in India. No American has passed it. 4,000 have tried. The reason they don't pass it is simple. By the end of the 10th grade in India, if you're in the academic track, you have had four years of physics taught by a physics major. No American can do it. This is a serious crisis. I mean, this is a, for those of you who are young enough, you're going to be here in 2050, this should worry you. We are not like, this is like the housing bubble. We have a learning bubble. I mean, we are not going to be competitive. In, in the model that I've been building, which, which uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Pete Case, has been helping me work through former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, I believe that there are seven major fundamental reforms you have to have for us to be a competitive country in 2050 in terms of China and India. They are litigation, regulation, taxation, education, health, energy, and infrastructure. And I think if you don't insist on those seven changes, that you will not be the leading country in the world, you will not be the safest country in the world, and you'll not be the most prosperous. I think it's that straight and that stark. And again, an example of scale, I've written two novels about World War II. The Japanese attack us on December 7, 1941. We get victory over Japan in August of 1945. That's 44 months. In three years and eight months, we mobilized the nation, put 15 and a half million people in uniform, build 50,000 aircraft a year, including the B-17, B-24, and B-29. We build a two-ocean navy. We sweep across North Africa, Sicily, Italy, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland, liberate uh, Denmark and Norway, conquer Germany, pivot, sweep across the Pacific, build the atomic bomb, which is the second most expensive project in the war, and deliver it with the B-29, which is the most expensive project in the war. In order to build the, B the, B the atomic bomb in a short time, we build three cities and 45 facilities. 
and we make two totally parallel processes because we don't know which one will work and it turns out both work. That is three years and eight months. It recently took 23 years to add a runway to the Atlanta airport. <laughs> there was a report this week that the emergency aid Congress passed for Mexico in June uh, may be delivered in two more years. It's pathetic. You, you can't imagine how bad our bureaucracies are, unless you've worked in them. And they're all resistant to change. They're all self-defensive. They're all protected by a whole series of laws and cumbersome uh, rights and regulations and union contracts. Uh, and it's a mess. And so I think if you want to get to effective implementation of public policy, you have to be prepared to fundamentally rethink how we run the government at every level, from the local school board to the county commission to the city council to the state to the federal. Now, my last uh, comment, a lot of this was driven in my experience. During the hart Redman Commission, we went up to the Kennedy School, and one of the uh, leaders at the Kennedy School had had a senior defense job under Clinton. And while we were talking, he said in passing, he says that one of my rules of life is that you learn every day, and you never know when you're going to learn, so you try to learn all day. Uh, that you guys on the hart Rudman Commission ought to study implementation. He said, everybody goes to Washington to fight over policy. And nobody goes to Washington to figure out how to get the machine to work. And so you're now like people who are standing in front of a car arguing about whether to drive to Boston or Los Angeles, and nobody's noticed that there's no engine. And that haunted me. We first said it to us in, uh, I think, 2000. And it haunted me, and then when I, did a, when I did my policy review in 2004 and 2005, that really captured it for me, that we need a fundamental review of how you effectively implement, as well as an argument over what you implement. And that is the great crisis in the American governing system in terms of, of effectiveness. And I think that it is a, a challenge for your generation that has to be met if we're going to be competitive uh, in the next 50 years. Let me, uh, if I might, just take questions, is that all right? So I assume we'll, we'll do it the old-fashioned way, I'll point. Yes, sir. Ah, they're, they're going to run around with a mic, this is great. We have mic people. Okay, so if you, would, if you don't mind, come out and stand in front of the mic. He's not going to bring it to you because it's too hard. Okay, and anybody over here, just queue up, just line up if you want to ask a question. We'll go back and forth real fast. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, last time I was here, um, all the colleagues standing up there, so I'd say that's a big change. Um, <laughs> my question is about uh, foreign policy and uh, in regards to the new administration. Um, do you feel like the new the Obama's administration, the new attitude they have towards uh, the Middle East, uh, I know we had a speech a couple days ago about the uh, Turkish parliament, do you feel like that's kind of <laughs> I didn't get the last part. New administration. Look, I, I, I think he is now at a, a defining moment in his administration. I think he had a very bad trip. I think it was fine PR-wise, but if you, look on, if you look beneath the surface, um, the Germans and the French didn't give him anything. Uh, he asked, he begged them for troops for Afghanistan. Uh, they promised a total of 5,000 as long as they didn't fight. Uh, which is, you know, I mean, at that point you sort of wonder, well, why don't you just send Red Cross teams or something? But I mean, literally, the ground rule was they couldn't fight, but you could have, you could have 5,000 troops as long as you don't ask them to do anything. Um, they're not willing to be tough with Iran. Um, you had this embarrassment on Sunday morning that the North Koreans deliberately fired their missile a few hours before Obama was going to give a speech on nuclear disarmament, which you think about it is a little strange. Uh, and he promised us, you can go back and read the speech, I'm not making this up, he promised us we're going to take hard action 
Well, the hard action was going to the UN. And at the UN, Medvedev apparently, while well, he really wanted to be good friends and were really going to cooperate, and they had a great meeting, and he really liked Obama a lot because they were really good friends, and they were really going to cooperate, uh, the Russians said no. And the Chinese said no. And so the UN is going to do nothing. So since the UN is going to do nothing, we're going to do nothing except explain that when they issue a statement at the UN, it will really be meaningful. And so what everybody here should forget what a totally bizarre moment this is. North Korea is steadily building nuclear weapons and missiles. Iran is steadily building nuclear weapons and missiles. Hamas is firing missiles into Israel virtually every day. And we're going to have a grand conference next year to talk about disarmament. Who's going to come? You think Pakistan and India are going to come and say yes? We now trust each other so much that because of the great effect of President Obama, we have decided that we are no longer going to need nuclear weapons. You think the Chinese are going to come and say, even though the Indians are going to keep the nuclear weapons to be able to stop the Pakistanis, we're going to give up our nuclear weapons because we really trust in the Obama effect. Do you think he's going to get anywhere with Iran and North Korea by being reasonable? These are countries led by brutal dictatorships. Kim Jong-il is such a bad dictator, he has shrunk the height of the average North Korean over the last two generations. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is you know, when I mean, you're laughing, this is a man who has had malnutrition. He and Mugabe are the two worst leaders of the planet in terms of the actual effect they've had on the people of their countries. And we do nothing. So my, the reason this is an interesting moment is he can be like Jimmy Carter and learn nothing out of this experience and try to live through four years out of contact with reality. Or he can be like John F. Kennedy, who had exactly the same experience on his first trip, was humiliated by Khrushchev, communicated a sense of weakness to Khrushchev, and within three months had ordered an enormous military buildup, including national, bringing the National Guard into federal service. And Kennedy learned that the world was much tougher than he thought it was. My hunch is Obama will have learned nothing, and that he is, in fact, much closer to Carter than he is to Kennedy. Yes. Um, I'm J.D. Brandon. Uh, I'm a triple major here at UGA, History and International Affairs. Um, I, I have a quick question. It's about, um, and this is the gets in on uh, government accountability. I would just have, uh, I'd like to say, we're welcome to UGA. Um, what would you have to say about Jeremy for violations of ethics that you had during the time as Speaker of the House? Sure. I was charged with 83 uh, violations by the Democrats who thought the biggest violation was that I led, I defeated them and drove them from power. Uh, <laughs> 80, 82 of the 83 charges were thrown out as having no substance. Uh, the 83rd, actually, we, w was a letter written by the attorney uh, at the law firm, which was technically wrong. I signed it, and I shouldn't have. And I not only agreed that it was wrong, but I paid the entire cost of the investigation, uh, something I think you will find no Democrat has done uh, in my lifetime. Thanks for coming. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Over the weekend, uh, I was looking at these employees that where you had argued that, uh, as you're saying, for the administration's response to how would you differentiate this response uh, from prior ones to, to missile threats uh, and uh, those responses? And how is our country less safe now under this response than it has been under the Bush administration's response, which often consisted of harsh rhetoric and nothing in back okay. I, I would say on the, on the narrow issue of North Korea that the State Department has been equally feckless under both administrations. Uh, and that the Bush administration was no more effective than the Obama administration. So if you, if you narrow it down to this one question, I issued my first suggestion that we stop the missile on the, on the launch pad in, in 2006. I mean, I have consistently thought the Bush administration allowed the State Department to define reality, and that is an invitation to a disaster. Uh, aside as an example of, a, of, how, of how endemic this problem is, uh, Chris and I just did this movie called Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous of Destiny. And in it, there's the scene where Reagan stands 
at the Berlin Wall and says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, interestingly, Reagan, who was very consistent in his career, had gone over as governor in 1967. And as a throwaway line, it said, that wall sure is ugly. They ought to tear it down. So when he's going back 20 years later, having won re-election by a landslide, uh, carried 49 states, uh, he decides he's going to go to the wall, and he's going to say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And we show in the movie, the State Department took it out. And they said, this will offend Gorbachev. Reagan wrote it back in. They took it out a second time. And I was told by George Schultz, the Secretary of State, after the second time, Reagan called Schultz and said, George, I am putting this back in. I want you to tell your speechwriter, I am the president. He is not. <laughs> now, the reason I cite that is, in foreign policy, on every occasion where the Bush administration followed the State Department, they were wrong. And they followed the State Department in North Korea. It got them nowhere. And the fact is today, the North Koreans routinely try to blackmail the rest of the world because they have a pathetic, disastrous, anti-human dictatorship which ought to be replaced. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Patrick Tanks. I'm a resident here in Athens, and we want to welcome you here. And my question for you is, given recently um, President Obama's comment on the world stage calling America arrogant, if you were in his shoes, how would you describe America to the rest of the world? <laughs> Well, look, look, let me say, first of all, there, there have been occasions when we've acted with arrogance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we were filming uh, the movie, we went to Pont du Hoc, which is the site at Normandy where the American troops, where the Rangers climbed the cliffs to uh, begin the liberation of Europe. And I had the, opportunity, the honor of uh, lowering the flag at the American Military Cemetery. Uh, and the American Military Cemetery has, I think, 20... We lost 2,300 people at uh, Omaha that day, but I think there are something like 10 or 12,000 people buried there. Um, and I was reminded, of, I think it was Tony Blair who once said that the only land the Americans asked for was the cemeteries for their people to be buried in. So I would say to the Europeans who we liberated in World War II, we protected for 45 years during the Cold War, we have sought to befriend, whose European Union we consciously supported, uh, that we are partners for freedom, uh, that we, would on, we on occasion need to listen to them better, and they on occasion need to help us more. And I think listening has to be backed up by helping. And for us to only go to listening while they don't go to helping is an inadequate relationship. Thank you so much for coming. I'm glad you brought up money ball. It's an excellent book. Uh, my question is, um, after suffering you know, tremendous losses in this recent election and bring in a really relative unknown uh, Michael Steele, what direction do you think the GOP is going to take in order to regain confidence on a national level? Well, let me, let me say, first of all, I think we have a lot of uh, emerging talent. And I think if you look at somebody like Bobby Jindal, uh, who's 37 years old and, and uh, you know, will be John McCain's age, I think, in 2044. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, Jindal has a long period to grow and learn and become a very sophisticated national leader. Um, I think the Republican Party has to do three things, and they're pretty straightforward. First of all, it has to, it has to worry about America and not worry about the Republican Party. And if the Republican Party worries about America and tries to solve America's problems, uh, people will be glad to uh, consider the Republican Party. Second, I think that it has to be a solution-oriented party and not be a, uh, an opposition party. I don't think people particularly want to go back to a red versus blue, play, you know, let's attack each other all day. Uh, I was delighted recently when Congressman John Boehner uh, led an effort that, that uh, Paul Ryan, who's the ranking member on budget, uh, brought forward a, 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 a budget which was created twice as many jobs for half the price based on the uh, economic data from, Clint, from uh, Obama's own uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. I think that's the right attitude is to come back again and again with new and better solutions and better ideas. And third, I think the Republican Party has to drop outreach programs and replace them with inclusion programs. Uh, we should reach out. We should try to bring in everybody in America who's not committed to a hard left ideology and try to work together with everybody in America to develop better solutions 
And if we do, we'll create relationships and friendships that will lead us to be, uh, by a large margin, the majority party within a very few years. Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm a student from the 6th District and got my first foray into politics walking in a parade with you back in the early 90s. I was a little kid. But my question for you is in Democracy in America, Tobe Bull talks about soft tyranny. Do you believe the Obama administration and some of the statists in Congress uh, are leading us on a path to a soft tyranny? Well, look, I, I think there's every reason to believe that a government strong enough to fire the president of General Motors is a government strong enough to threaten everybody. And I think that uh, what you have right now, both in the Supreme Court uh, and in the Congress and the bureaucracy, is a drift towards governmental power that should bother every American. And if you look at how Geithner has organized uh, his efforts at bailout, it is crony capitalism of the worst kind. Uh, and it's basically designed to pick winners and losers and it's designed to do so in a way that guarantees that politicians and bureaucrats have maximum power. So yeah, I think, I think that there's a, uh, th there's a very grave danger of government becoming so powerful and politicians and bureaucrats becoming so powerful uh, that it's a genuine threat uh, to the freedom of the average individual. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question was kind of going back to foreign policy, and I was really curious. Um, I think most people would agree that, uh, you know, North Korea and Zimbabwe have suffered atrocities uh, under the regimes of Kim Jong-il and Robert Mugabe. But I was curious as to what your thoughts were on the next step after, you know, say we, we do remove these two leaders, um, you know, and what role the United States should play, if any, in the rebuilding of these countries. Because I think it's parallel to the description of policy and implementation. Everyone agrees to the policy. Everyone agrees on the policy. That's the, what you come to fight for, and it's easy. But then what follows is really difficult, and uh, no one wants to touch that issue. Well, look, I, I think that it is in the American interest to be a good neighbor and to help countries uh, achieve prosperity and to achieve the, or, the, the rule of law and achieve uh, physical safety. And, and uh, you know, my, my primary critique of foreign aid is that it hasn't worked because it's been government to government. And if, if what you have is an American bureaucrat sending a check to a foreign bureaucrat, who's in a corrupt system, you haven't, you haven't created development aid. I mean, I'd much rather see us take the equivalent of foreign aid and turn it into a tax credit for investment and have American companies create permanent jobs in countries that have governments that are law-abiding uh, and, and that, that are safe. I think, but in the case of something like, like Zimbabwe and North Korea, it is in the world's interest to replace regimes that are that destructive. And you ought to be able to apply a variety of techniques. Remember. We unraveled the Soviet empire under Reagan without any shots being fired in Eastern Europe. There, there was a skirmish going on in, in Afghanistan, and there was a skirmish going on in Central America. <coughs> but Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, the Slovak Republic, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, all those countries, the, the place disintegrated, and you ended up with freedom coming largely because of a 10-year campaign that was led by, by Pope John Paul II and then supported by Margaret Thatcher and by Ronald Reagan. And the, the three of them created a soft campaign of continuous pressure uh, as a result of which the Soviet Empire collapsed. If we put as much effort into uh, replacing Kim Jong-il as we put into placating him, you'd have a new regime there. And the people of North Korea would be dramatically better off and you would be marginally safer. Yeah. Um, thanks again for taking our questions. Um, I guess my question is, just given the, well, just the current state of the country, both economically, uh, politically, what do you think is the best uh, approach to take towards um, global warming from a government perspective, especially as it's become increasingly politicized, um, as there's talks of uh, labeling carbon as a polluted, a lot of things that would have effects in the economy and uh, something that Scientifically, uh, I'm not sure if it's ready to be uh, politicized yet. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me say, first of all, that I used to teach environmental studies at West Georgia College, and I was the coordinator in the early 1970s. Um, Terry Maple and I wrote a book two years ago called Contract with the Earth, which outlines what we described as green conservatism. I believe very much in using science and technology, and I, I believe in incentives, including prizes and, and tax credits. 
Uh, I am very opposed to an energy tax such as Obama's proposed, uh, and I am very opposed to what EPA is trying to do. You have, you have basically an, un you know, an unelected Supreme Court setting up a ruling for EPA by which unelected bureaucrats can create a regime for carbon which could bankrupt the country. Now, that is a fairly bad process. Uh, I would also tell you flatly, I, I do not believe there is any evidence of sufficient damage in the next 50 years to justify radical deindustrialization of the modern world. And people tend to forget. Everywhere you look on the planet, if you have more electricity, you have a higher civilization. I mean, there are no current models of how you have a non-electric civilization that isn't extraordinarily poverty-stricken. And I think the idea of building it, I mean, the carbon tax and the EPA regulations would be like building a giant bridge for jobs to go to China. And so if you want the Chinese Full Employment Act, uh, then an energy tax will certainly move you in that direction. <laughs> yes, sir. The, the, the folks who are here now are the last questions. So the, the, you're, you're the last four. Go ahead. I just want to comment to you on the for coming. I want to be back to some more administration questions because I have to stand tomorrow and I'm going to you on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason why I was back with you and President Clinton is that I don't want to get into sort of the politics of it, but the, there was an effective tool we talked about in class about kind of shutting down the government and putting it at a standstill. The first one, the question I want to ask you was do you think that's an effective tool for Congress to use? And the second one was, a lot of times, one of the fundamental changes we talk about is downsizing bureaucracy. And I wonder what your thoughts were maybe to reorganizing the bureaucracy and then actually investing more power into it so that it can get done. Because oftentimes when we downsize, we ask the, the organization to do the exact same thing with a fewer number of people. So I wonder what your thoughts on that, too. Yeah, those are both good questions. Uh, on the first one, I I'm, I'm have a fundamentally different view than the news media. Uh, I think that shutting down the government was, in the end, very helpful to Republicans. And the reason it was helpful to Republicans, remember, not only were we the first Republican majority in 40 years, we are the first re-elected Republican majority since 1928. And it's always intrigued me that nobody went back and asked, how do we get re-elected? And we're the only Republican majority elected while a Democratic president was getting re-elected. And so I'm always curious, well, why do people think this was such a bad idea? Because in the Washington press corps, they'll all, they'll all tell you it was a big mistake. What it actually signaled was that we were serious, that we weren't normal politicians, and that we were prepared to run real risks to get to a balanced budget. And something like 90% of the country wanted a balanced budget. And by the way, your generation, when they figure out how many taxes you'll pay in your lifetime to pay for the Obama deficits, you're going to be staggered at the, at the interest on the debt you pay in your lifetime. And my guess is when that number starts to sink in, people are going to be very excited about getting back to a balanced budget. We, we, didn't, we weren't just balancing it for fun. We were trying to design an economic model that actually reduced interest rates and reduced taxes and allowed people to keep more of their own money uh, and, and made government function. Second, depends on how you downsize and what you downsize. If you go out in the private sector, and you look at virtually every manufacturing and service company that's effective, they've all learned how to do dramatically more work with fewer people. And they've been doing it for 40 or 50 years. And if you look at the Toyota production system, it's remarkable taking waste out. I don't know of any federal bureaucracy that functions like the Toyota production system. But it's the most powerful single method of productivity on the planet. And I, I was a student of both Deming and Drucker. And I'll just tell you, there's virtually no federal bureaucracy that couldn't be 20% more effective almost overnight uh, if it, in fact, it was willing to follow some simple models of quality and efficiency. But it would function very differently than it does right now. And, and I have zero doubt that you can afford to have a dramatically smaller federal bureaucracy, and it would be more effective than it is right now. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I'd like to say that my wife and I uh, thoroughly enjoy your conversation Bill O'Reilly and others on the line. <laughs> saw you last night, particularly the conversations relative to the lack of European support against terror. We recently uh, had a trip to South America where we visited uh, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, and Santiago, Chile. We were very impressed, uh, first of all, with the large populations there, and also with the prosperity that we saw in the areas we were allowed to see. I'm just wondering if, uh, since we do not have a lot of European support, uh, could we ever? 
think that some of our American uh, neighbors uh, might lend us some support there. Uh, uh, but do they still think that they're being protected by James Monroe? Well, I think, I think there are circumstances where they provide support, and on occasion they have in the past. Uh, but I, I think for most of them, it's a long way off. You know, I mean, even for us, Afghanistan's a long way off. And if you're Brazil or Chile, it just seems like, why would you go there? I mean, I think they would under circumstances where they thought it mattered. You know, the Brazilians were helpful both in Korea and in World War II. Uh, but I think that they're not, you know, they're not going to do it unless there's some overwhelming reason. Yes? Thanks a lot for speaking, sir. My question is about foreign policy of the current administration. Um, with nations such as North Korea and Iran continuing to work with them to try to put up their nuclear arms, do you think that nations such as her allies are such a big group that by then Yahoo would be forced to act unilaterally against Iran? Not with each other? Or, excuse me, or do you think that Obama would uh, step in and try to assist them with that? Um, I think there's an outside possibility that at some point Israel will think they've crossed the line and they will act. I think that the reason that the uh, Labor Party agreed to serve in the government with uh, Netanyahu, even though they have very deep differences, is because Ehud Barak, who was the uh, senior Israeli general before he was prime minister and then was chief of uh, the head of military affairs, uh, or minister of defense, rather, uh, I think Barack and Obama and, and, and Netanyahu agreed that Iran is such a mortal threat to Israel uh, that they may have to take significant military action. Uh, and, that, and I think that's the only reason that Barack would agree to serve with Netanyahu. So I would not be shocked to have Israel preempt and do something. What I'm not sure of is what they technically at a practical level can do. Uh, in terms of uh, take, because the Iranian program is largely underground and largely hidden, and I think it would be fairly difficult for them to get at. Yes, sir, you had, you're the last question. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to turn your attention again to, to more of a domestic issue. Um, I hail from a very small town in northeastern Arizona called St. John's, which happens to be the very same small town in North Sea Hall. And unfortunately, it's also the same small town where I grew up with Amanda and with Vincent Romero lost his life and his eight-year-old son uh, by a gun. And obviously, in recent times, uh, we've seen some unfortunate senseless acts of violence in North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Washington State. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing, you, know, you speak of implementing change, discussing our values. The topic today was affecting American policy in a dangerous world. I'm interested in also knowing your ideas for implementing this change, uh, and your ideas on affecting American policy and making this America. It's frankly, sir, I'm tired of Americans killing Americans and seeing these senseless acts happen. Well, my view is, first of all, that effective policing does a great deal to stop that. And if you look at a place like Philadelphia, which has a very high crime rate, uh, you also will find out that the judges refuse to lock up criminals. Uh, that they, they had refused to prosecute murderers, uh, and they refused to keep them in jail. Uh, in places like Richmond, where they had a very specific program targeting uh, violent criminals, they radically reduced the murder rate, uh, and, and uh, made it, they simply made it too difficult for criminals to carry guns. If you look at the, uh, the and, and I, I'll just tell you, and I, I suspect we may have some philosophical dialogue here. Um, if you look at, at Staten Island, Staten Island is, 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 in essence, a city of 620,000 people uh, with virtually no crime. And it's not because they have no guns. It's because they have a healthy culture. Uh, they have uh, good policing. They have no uh, drug trade and no, no local crime that matters. And as a result, it's a very, very safe community. Uh, and most of the drug violence, I mean, most of the gun violence in America is actually violence that relates directly to criminals. Uh, and I think if we were more directly focused on violent criminals and on suppressing violent criminal behavior, uh, you, we'd have a remarkable reduction uh, in violent crime in America. But I also, I personally believe strongly in the Second Amendment because I think it was actually written by the Founding Fathers very explicitly uh, as a political amendment designed to enable the people to remain an armed militia uh, and not to be overawed by their government. And I think that there's a 
deep historic reason why the Second Amendment is part of the American system. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much.